Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Harrison. I'm director of the Aerospace Security Project here at CSIS. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator for the event today uh, entitled Space Situational Awareness and Space Traffic Management Coordination Among U.S. Government Agencies. Uh, and uh, to have this discussion, we are so happy that we've uh, gotten uh, representatives from the three key government agencies that are really involved. Uh, in this transition uh, and the management and the use of space situational awareness data across the US government. So please join me, uh, I will go through uh, and welcome each of our panelists uh, and then uh, we will begin our discussion. So first of all, I wanna welcome Lori Newman. Uh, she manages NASA's Conjunction Assessment Risk Analysis Program which provides safety of flight uh, services for NASA's uncrewed missions. She's also the agency's point of contact for space situational awareness for uncrewed missions as part of the agency's enterprise protection program. Uh, next up, I uh, wanna welcome uh, Gordon Kordiak, who's a senior materiel lead and division chief running the Space and Missile Systems Center's Space Domain Awareness Division out in California. Uh, he's responsible for the development and sustainment of the U.S. Space Force's broader dedicated space domain awareness global architecture. Mr. Kordiak is also dual hatted as the Space Force's uh, executive agent for space domain awareness charged with aligning internal and external Space Force stakeholders to establish an integrated and capable end-to-end -end space domain awareness enterprise. And I uh, also wanna welcome Mark Daly. Uh, he is the Deputy for Operations in the US Department of Commerce Office of Space Commerce, uh, where he is establishing the Department of Commerce presence out at Vandenberg Air Force Base, which will provide critical interface for the civilian to military operations for space situational awareness and space traffic management. Uh, so as you can see, just by reading through all of their bios, uh, we have exactly the right people here uh, to have this uh, discussion today. So I wanna welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and Mark, let's kick off the discussion with you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving our audience an overview of uh, Space Policy Directive 3, what that means uh, for how the US government is gonna handle space situational awareness and space traffic management, uh, and the status of transitioning those functions from uh, the Department of Defense to the Department of Commerce. So Mark, over to you. Thank you, Todd, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's part of the CSIS webinar on space situational awareness, space traffic management, coordination among US agencies. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues, Gordon and Lori, um, which I work with quite extensively. Um, going back to Space Pil Policy Directive 3 was, was issued in uh, June of 2018 um, to address the increasing congested space environment and to ensure in long-term sustainability of space activities for all nations. Uh, SPD 3 uh, specifically states to ensure the coordination of space traffic in the future operating environment in recognition of the need for DOD to focus on maintaining access and to uh, freedom of action in space. A civil agency should be the focal point for collision avoidance support services and the Department of Commerce shall be that agency. SPD 3 specifically tasks DOC and DOD on two areas, uh, cooperatively developing a plan for basic SSA and STM services directly or through partnerships with industry and academia, and also the coordination and development of standards and protocols for creation of an open architecture data repository to improve SSA interoperability and enable greater SSA data sharing. Since SPD3, our partnership with DOD and NASA has grown even stronger. Uh, we recently hosted General Dickinson, the commander of U.S. Space Command and Commerce, and participated with General Raymond, the chief of space operations uh, in the U.S.-Japan Comprehensive Space Dialogue in Tokyo to explain our collective plans. 
We're currently working on a memorandum of understanding with DOD in order to detail our transition over the next few years. In addition to my interactions out at the Combined Space Operations Center and the 18th Space Control Squadron out at Vandenberg, uh, Commerce is also participating in a number of uh, experiments and exercises designed to help understand how to incorporate government as well as commercial capabilities. Gordon and I talk on a regular basis and, and look to coordinate, consult, and leverage activities from the DOD. On NASA, NASA's leadership, in particular the centers at Goddard and Ames have been incredibly helpful in reviewing our approaches and initial OADR architectural concepts. Lori and I talk also on a bi-weekly basis to explore lessons learned and how we can leverage uh, lessons learned and improve the operations for the future. Uh, OSC's work is also continues with other federal partners like the State Department and FAA um, around international guidelines and supporting cooperation that will be essential to space flight safety. Our efforts on standards continues with the FAA and others. We, we look, uh, we work with other organizations such as ANSI, uh, Space Safety Coalition, ASTM International, and recently the ISO um, has, has had a submittal for a space traffic coordination and management standard. Um, we look to try to pursue uh, standards on a voluntary and consensus basis, but also trying to make sure that we get industry's best practices as we move forward. Uh, Title 51 US code has long provided authorities to the Office of Space Commerce to foster conditions for economic growth and technological advancement of US space commerce industry, streamline and anticipate licensing, regulatory and export reforms, and also promote international norms, standards, and sustainable practices. So as we've been developing things, uh, one of the issues that came out in the FY20 appropriations language was for NAPA, the National Academy of Public Administration, uh, to assess OSC's role in the SSA STM uh, environment. Um, they started off activities in March, um, conducted hundreds, hundred over 100 interviews with various stakeholders from not only government, but also industry, academia, um, and came up with their findings at the end of August. Um, the senior panel of senior government officials uh, unanimously agreed that DOC's Office of Space Commerce was best suited to perform the space traffic management task within the federal government. The, the NAPA study highlighted OSC's uh, concept of operations using a collaborative approach um, involving the military, civilian, commercial, and industry, but also drawing upon the department's resources as well. Uh, NOAA uh, currently operates a, a number of satellites, uh, uh, civilian weather satellites, but also is responsible for space weather capabilities as well in its uh, space weather prediction center. NIST has expertise in cybersecurity and standards evaluation. And NTIA has policy efforts related to radio frequency interference. But there's also a broader DOC discipline of uh, collecting complex data sets, analyzing them, and providing them to the broader public for dissemination. The NAPA study had urged Congress to immediately enact appropriations to OSC to build the critical capability necessary for the personnel and infrastructure to carry out these responsibilities for the whole of government uh, for SSA and STM. Uh, we've moved quickly. Um, recently, over the, the last uh, several months, you know, building off of the NAPA experience, you know, that's allowed us to kind of formalize some of our initial concepts and plans as to how to actually uh, build this um, SSA, STM, leveraging what, what DOD has, has already put in place and some of its capabilities as well. Um, we put together a plan for the next several years um, as we started to try to move out. We've looked at legal authorities and try to verify that we are, do have sufficient authorities uh, to execute the SPD-3 mission. Uh, we've also collected uh, inputs across the US government to establish kind of the baseline assumptions that, that we would need for how the model would actually operate and function. Um, we put together our initial plans, um, uh, developed a initial concept on what the architectural uh, layout would actually be with inputs from DOD, NASA, as well as FFRDC participants. 
Um, we've also leveraged the NOAA Big Data Project, which is a cloud environment and put out one data set um, related to NOAA space weather as kind of an initial concept on you know, how things could actually operate. We've also you know, inter interjected with, with uh, uh, CRADAs for R&D and the academia, as well as uh, even some of the commercial companies that have like-minded um, uh, uh, approaches that, that would be useful as we start to try to uh, put together the OADR. And next week in particular, we're having an industry day to further refine the, the development and concepts as we start to move out um, granted, you know, we're still awaiting funding for the FY21 appropriation, but still trying to get industry's inputs on our initial concepts that we've developed internally inside the U.S. government. So, thank you, Tom. All right, thank you for that, Mark. Um, let's see, uh, next, Gordon, I'm going to go to you, um, you know, as our Space Force representative on the panel. Uh, and see if you could give us some sort of uh, the historical context uh, about the SSA and STM mission uh, and how that has evolved into what, you know, we're now calling space domain awareness. Um, and, you know, and what are some of the things that DOD is going to continue to do, even though uh, some of these functions are transitioning over to commerce? So over to you, Gordon. Thank you, Todd. And I just want to echo uh, Mark's comments and, and how privileged I feel to be here with with Mark and Lori, but also um, rep representing Space Force and speaking at CSS CSIS. Uh, the the history for space traffic management within the Department of Defense is one that that goes back um, decades to the 80s, and it's closely linked with NASA as we stand up the the first uh, beginnings for on orbit conjunction assessment and keeping objects in space from running into each other. Over that time, this partnership has stayed strong with NASA and, and has continued to, to grow and evolve and mature. Um, if I step back from that general statement, within um, my broader portfolio, we manage a, a global network of, of sensors, uh, radars, telescopes, different phenomenologies that are ground-based and space-based. And we orchestrate those sensors. We take the data that's coming off of them and we, we aggregate it and provide it into operational squadrons like you have at the 18th Space Control Squadron out at Vandenberg and ultimately generate the basis by which we have an understanding of the space domain. That understanding historically has materialized in two ways. One is tied to work being done uh, in a public service model through websites like spacetrack.org, where we put lower fidelity, yet very important information out to the public uh, community for uh, managing risk to their broader architectures in, in the space domain. Separate from that, we manage a higher, or we work with operations to facilitate data that, that allows a higher level of accuracy and information, when we call special perturbations, that generates uh, um, uh, CDMs, uh, conjunction data messages that ultimately hand off to NASA and become the basis by which NASA and others within the community, uh, be it public or private, um, government or not, uh, help to accept risk and ultimately make decisions about how to manage their constellations on orbit. This process is something that's evolved over the last uh, 30 years and is core and fundamental to the the what was historically within the Space Force called the Space Situational Awareness Mission. Today, or rather about a year ago, leading up through today, this recognition was made that just simply managing objects in space isn't satisfactory enough. We need to have a deeper, more proactive, res um, resilient response to objects and events on orbit and understanding from a defense perspective if something that maneuvers is doing so for a hostile purpose or not. And in parallel with that realization understanding, uh, it was decided from a doctrine perspective that space situational awareness would be rebranded to space domain awareness about a little over a year ago. In context of that rebranding, space domain awareness now is, is really taking space traffic management functions, but taking also intelligence data, blue force status, status data, environmental monitoring data, 
and aggregate it all together to get the most real-time picture of what's happening and to allow us to have what I like to call as real-time domain control and understanding at any point in time of what is actually happening in the space domain and, and is it hostile or is it not. But as we've, we've pursued that activity and, and sought to deliver that more responsive and proactive nature for the mission, the realization is the architecture we have is getting stretched. It is the most capable in the world today, but it has to be able to handle not just a wartime load, but also it, it handles the, the public service and, and the work that's been done uh, for decades that I described earlier. So in the context of Space Policy Directive 3 and the stand-up of Department of Commerce to take on uh, space traffic management functions for a civil and commercial aspect, we really see a partnership occurring across multiple departments and, and US government agencies here with DOC, with NASA, with DOD and others to, to say, how do we load balance? How do we share the responsibility of this mission that is becoming more challenging as objects in space get smaller, as threats get smaller, as timelines to respond get, to respond to the threats get shorter? How can we take the resources within the Department of Defense and focus those on the tactical uh, nature and the, the national security interests that we have to be responsible for. Generally, we call, call this protect and defend operations. How do we manage the protection and the defense of our on-orbit assets? If we focus on that responsibility, now Department of Commerce comes online and helps us cover down on the civil commercial aspects and together managing a common set of capabilities and data sets and working in partnership with each other to, to drive the mission forward, we can cover down on this expanding mission that really takes on so much more than it did 40 years ago. Back to you, Todd. All right, thank you. Uh, and then Lori, I wanna go to you next. Uh, so uh, I wanna get your perspective because NASA not only participates um, you know, in the analysis of SSA data, but NASA is itself a user of SSA products. Uh, so I was hoping you could Talk about this from a user perspective, uh, and then also share, you know, your perspective on what is the importance of uh, SSA to the space environment and to commercial and civil applications in space. So, Lori, over to you. Sure. Thanks uh, very much for inviting me to be part of the discussion today. Um, as you said, NASA's um, on the the user side of this, but we also have some overlap with um, some analysis, and Gordon has um, alluded to some of that. But uh, basically, regularized conjunction assessment uh, was originally developed in the 1980s um, as a partnership between DOD and NASA in order to protect humans in space. So um, this included development of the high accuracy or sometimes called special perturbation space object catalog and uh, a message called the orbital conjunction message, which is the precursor to the conjunction data message that we all use today. Um, there's also two line elements. There's a catalog of those that are um, publicly available, but those lack a covariance and they're not of sufficient accuracy to perform CA computations. So TLEs weren't developed for that reason and um, therefore shouldn't be used for CA risk assessment. But the CA process really has three steps. Uh, the first one is called screening. Um, it involves comparing the trajectory of the protected asset against the trajectories of all the other objects in the catalog to predict when close approaches will occur. So NASA relies on DOD to maintain that catalog. And um, we have our own personnel who perform the actual screening activity, but they sit at Vandenberg right next to the 18th Space Control Squadron staff and use the same catalog and the same software. So then the second step of the process is risk assessment. So um, NASA performs this step ourselves. Um, we do this for NASA at uh, Goddard as part of my conjunction assessment risk analysis uh, program, the CARA program for all the NASA missions, except for those who are affiliated with human spaceflight. And those are supported out of NASA Johnson by the flight dynamics staff um, there. So this risk assessment step is critical because CDMs require further analysis to determine whether the predicted close approaches require mitigation, either due to geometry or inherent uncertainties in the orbit determination or other factors, um, all of which together indicate the presence of a high likelihood of collision. 
So CDMs should not be considered to be standalone warnings of an impending collision. They really um, require this extra analysis. So in addition to doing that operations work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as part of this partnership, um, NASA also has a research and development team who's actively seeking to improve algorithms and processes for our CA operations. And um, often we um, share data with DOD to try to have a, a bigger set to analyze and um, this benefits um, all of our organizations. So um, the third step of the process is um, mitigation. So that's really the responsibility of the owner operator. CARE is more of a middleman um, organization in between the screeners and the um, the owner operator. But um, we assist in the mitigation process by creating trade spaces that indicate um, the appropriate size and timing of maneuvers that will lower the collision risk to an acceptable level. So um, we are an end user of the current DOD CA process and we intend to continue using that existing service. Um, that's obviously possible for us because we have our own staff on site at Vandenberg um, who perform this function for us. And we'll continue to partner with DOD to perform um, data analysis and al algorithm development. Um, and uh, as Mark mentioned, um, we've been uh, sharing lessons learned with Department of Commerce as they work to establish an architecture that meets their vision of the future. And um, we'll you know, keep track of that as, as it continues to develop. And um, once it developed, if it, if it meets our needs, then we'll uh, use that process as well. So, um, but NASA has this 30 year history of performing conjunction assessment and we're anxious to uh, share that with the growing cadre of space operators that are, um, that are it's continuing to grow. Um, we'll be publishing a handbook in the coming week or two that explains the process that NASA uses for our own conjunction assessment um, in the hopes that uh, that's educational for other space operators. And we also have a public facing software repository that contains many of our algorithms packaged up with test data that can be used by other space operators in their systems. So thanks very much. Great. Um, and thank you, Lori, uh, for that perspective as well. So I, I want, before I open it up for questions from the audience, and I see we've already got some great questions uh, coming in. Um, so those of you out there uh, on Zoom, if you hit that Q&A button at the bottom of your window, uh, you can see the questions that have already been asked. You can upvote them uh, or you can type in your own question as well. Um, but before we go to those, I've, I've got, of course, a few questions of my own. Uh, the first question, and really this is to, to all three of you, but I'll start with Mark. Um, what is the anticipated role for commercial SSA systems. That's, one of been, that's been one of the interesting developments over the past several years is that commercial companies have been developing their own SSA capabilities, uh, ground-based radars, optical telescopes. Uh, they're producing their own data. Uh, and you know, I just wanted to get your thoughts uh, as well as uh, the other panelists on how does that factor into this transition of uh, SSA and STM to the Department of Commerce and, and what role do those companies play? Uh, so so there, we look at it as, as vital to not only our, our mission and also kind of direction out of SPD3. Um, you know, we've, we've got it split between what we call the, the basic service and, and advanced services, the, the basic being what, what the government would actually fund. Um, as we move forward, you know, we'd like to try to leverage the, the networks of commercial data providers that are actually out there. Um, if we can, you know, vet the information and, and make sure that it, it still provides the same level of, of service that we actually have from the, the data sources uh, that the government already has that, that Gordon was talking about on the SSN network. You know, so we're looking at kind of a initial, you know, rollout of, you know, starting with kind of the taking over the, the CDM dissemination mission for civil and commercial actors. It's mostly going to be um, DOD based and then look at a way to try to incorporate the commercial data. Um, so not necessarily have a dependency on, on the DOD network so that they can use it for other purposes as well. Um, but we're also looking at, you know, the opportunities that would allow the commercial marketplace to actually grow. Um, you know, as, as Lori pointed out, you know, the, the conjunction data messages, you know, is just one element of trying to get to, to space traffic management. There's, there's many different 
mission sets that are going to come forward, many different products as well. Um, being able to establish an open architecture data repository that enables the development of these new tools and services um, to other things that we may not have actually envisioned um, initially. Um, but we're trying to do this balance between um, making sure that the, the basic service um, does not impede the emergence of a larger space safety marketplace itself. Uh, so allow those companies and all to come in and compete um, but also making sure that we have an R&D environment to, to allow those, those uh, companies to also flourish as well um, and take advantage of academia, um, providing data sets that, that academia could leverage uh, to provide additional insights to improve not only the basic service, but also allow for the development of the advanced service is, is very important to, to get to the point where we're not only providing a reliable and trustworthy basic service um, for spaceflight safety, but also allowing for the incorporation of new technologies as things rapidly change um, as we move forward and improve uh, safety and stability in the, in the space operating environment. So Gordon or, or Lori, uh, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Gordon? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, first, before I jump into the role of commercial specifically, I think it's, it's important to frame some context from a DoD perspective. The use, well, historically we have traditional data, what's considered internal Space Force, Air Force data sets that are, are known, understanded, we call them trusted. Then you have non-traditional data sets that come from third parties, it could be coalition, it could be commercial, it could be uh, non-traditional sources that we don't um, know, understand um, every inch of, of the pipeline from when that piece of data was collected to when it's being exploited. How in the DoD we leverage trusted versus non-trusted data really drives our paradigm uh, and, and how we consider using commercial data in the future. For me, from a defense perspective, I orient around, I think of a pyramid and the foundation of that pyramid is tied to a government architecture of sensors that sees out into outer space and tracks objects and gives us awareness of what's happening. It's important to have that architecture in place, and it's why the DoD will always have a role within space traffic management, because our risk posture and from an ops perspective and our, our data policies for sharing information, using information, restrict the amount of, of, of um, risk that we can accept in making decisions. Uh, much like in the air community, I'm not gonna put a, a bomb on target without having a DOD sensor that, that uh, validates that target. Same thing on the space side. I'm not gonna make a decision about a maneuver in space as being hostile or not, unless I have a, a trusted sensor that we know we can make that decision with. I'm not saying that's always gonna be the case in the future, but today it is what guides our, our methodology and our approach. And so that paradigm is something that is being looked at and is evolving. The same type of paradigm changes are happening when it comes to different ways to exploit uh, non-DOD sensor sources as well as uh, data services. And that's really where we jump into the commercial aspects of things. For me today, as we, there's not a, a, a probably more important conversation that I have with folks than the role of, of commercial data, uh, whether it's engaging with uh, congressional, congressional staffers or general officers at the senior space force level or stakeholders and peers across um, the SDA community. The question is not, will we learn how to use commercial data or will we use it? The question is, what is going to have to happen in order to, to allow us to most effectively augment our architecture with commercial sources? Today, we're looking at ways to, to aggregate data through commercial, um, uh, commercial data sets and other sources through these these universal data access points, we call it a unified data library. It is a paradigm changing uh, capability that gets us out of stovepipes for sharing data and into a common authoritative source that allows us now to look at uh, multiple types of information from multiple sources and embed it in a way that our new CONOPS, our new paradigm changing ways of, of doing say space domain awareness can, can be played out to help us uh, exploit the latent potential of every data set, commercial coalition or other. 
On top of that, commercial is more than just the data it provides. And certainly it can provide support to us from uh, Leo orbit regime all the way out to the moon. It's also about the services that they provide and whether they're talking about characterization, patterns of life, combat ID, uh, exploitation of data from like say an artificial intelligence perspective or from uh, a, a offloading or potentially augmenting the basic functions that we do within the DOD today using commercial services to take care of those activities allows us to have better understanding and awareness and allows us to tap into innovation of industry so that we can focus our resources, what they are anyways, on events that are happening in space. And so we can also load balance and share and cover down on the, the, the demands of the entire domain, which on a day-by-day -day basis is getting more complex. So I, I think commercial is going to have a very rich and necessary role in the future. Today, we're learning how to change the paradigm so that we can accept commercial data and services and have it be in line with our systems to, to facilitate operations. And we're working to have that conversation in a way that's really going to looking and needing to be respectful of a commercial a company's business model. And there, we recognize there has to be a, a conversation there of how we can accept data from a commercial uh, provider, as well as how we can satisfy the equities of, of the DOD and, and the national security space uh, needs. So all that together is, is a rich conversation that's playing out today. And it's gonna be very important in the near future as we really scale to, to meet to the impending threats that, look, that we look at ahead of us. Lori, I want to go to you next to get your thoughts on commercial SSA data, uh, especially from a NASA perspective as a user of, of data. Um, and also, if you wouldn't mind, um, talking a little bit about uh, how NASA views international uh, SSA data sources. Uh, so sources that are either coming from foreign governments or foreign companies uh, and how that data can or, or should be used. Sure. So um, obviously, as I've said, we're a, a user of the, the DOD service. We consider that to be our baseline, as it's um, stated in the National Space Policy. So we will always continue to use that data. Um, that said, we see all these new sources of information coming available, and we'd like to be able to um, see where we can make use of those. So um, we have been actively working um, at uh, the 18th Space Facility in Vandenberg to merge um, other data sources in with the space surveillance network data source that the DOD has um, so that they can be um, put in the same pot, if you will, and then um, make one orbit determination solution that comes off of the combined data set. Um, we feel it's really important to have one definitive data source instead of having multiple solutions from multiple sources because that becomes confusing for users and hopefully there's no truth data because that would mean there's a collision and we don't all want to go there. But um, that does make it hard to decide what data to use. So combining them, we think, is, is the best um, method. We could also get um, products from commercial users, such as ephemerides, that could be combined instead of the raw tracking observations. But um, that makes it more complicated. Um, it requires more extensive validation. And it's not as easy to produce a product that we could then go and propagate forward and, and do things with. So um, that's that's been an important factor in how we decided to do this. And also um, making sure that the data is calibrated when it comes in, the SSN sensors are all calibrated and we wanna make sure that if we're mixing data that um, we have the same level of confidence in, in the data that we're mixing in. So um, that's really important for us. Um, from an international perspective, um, we work very closely with um, several international partners um, on safety of flight, both not really from a data acceptance perspective, because like I said, we've been, um, using the DOD model um, and whatever data the DOD chooses to include, um, then we would get to take advantage of. Um, but um, the Europeans, um, CNES in particular, um, has a, a very robust process that they've been using the EU um, folks. And so um, it's always beneficial for us to share um, lessons learned and experiences with uh, our counterparts there. and um, 
be able to maximize safety of flight by sharing and cooperating. We also have joint missions where we um, share data with um, our international counterparts. And um, so that's very helpful as well. So that's really how we get involved with the international community. Uh, I want to go quickly. A question I see from the audience, it's got a lot of upvotes. Uh, and Gordon, I think you're the one to answer this. Um, is the space fence online and when should we expect the public catalog to start listing the thousands of new objects it should be able to track? So uh, before I, I jump to that question, I just want to key on something that, that Lori said that's important. Uh, when we talk about using the data coming off of international sensors or are the rather the, the sensors from our allies or from commercial sources. Historically, we've, we've put in place this, this process that is time consuming and requires us to have trusted, um, pristine understanding of a sensor's data integrity. And we call this numeric validation. Today, we are, are working to change the paradigm so that instead of having a small team of people that are experts in the field of data validation, we're now using commercial tools to manage the, the, the tolerances and the biases of a data set to, to baseline it over time and to manage it within tolerance of that baseline. And rather than having to pristinely validate every sensor set before I can add it into the mix to get that authoritative set of data, now I can look at is a sensor's data set consistent over time? If it is, great, let's use it. If it's not, let's excise it out, let's fix it, and let's put it back in. And in doing that, we can now accelerate the timelines. And we, can, we can reduce our, our barrier to entry, our risk threshold, to exploit data more readily uh, in support of any number of needs, whether a DOD national security defense need, whether a NASA uh, a safety of flight need, or a DSC civil commercial STM function. Uh, when we talk about the DoD architecture in specific, Space Fence, to your question, is by far um, our newest and, and, and shiniest uh, new sensor in the architecture. It just uh, went operational in the last year, and we have uh, continued to uh, get data off of it and uh, understand that data and inter engage that data uh, for use in space traffic management. The, the challenge and the unique of any uh, consideration of any sensor is that when it goes online, it always has to be dialed in. There's a difference between what is um, projected or model performance in a data set and then what is the real performance. And this is a very natural part of managing a sensor architecture. Space Fence is seeing objects that, um, more objects than we've ever found in the low earth orbit. And it's seeing objects out to uh, has the ability to see objects out into to geo. And so as we baseline that sensor and we roll it into the architecture, today we're continuing to understand the data that comes off of it. We're learning how to operate it in the terms of, a, of, of, a, of um, its new capabilities and inherent capabilities for like, search-based operations. And ultimately, as that data feeds into the 18 Space Control Squadron and they use it for space traffic management today, the data then augments the catalog and gets pushed down to spacetrack.org. I think we're still uh, in, in terms of uh, FY21, uh, fiscal 21, of, of seeing that data start to, to pop out in spacetrack.org. Uh, uh, today, it's still going to that, that validation, or excuse me, the, um, the um, refinement process, if you will, to, to make sure that when we understand how we're using that data, it is consistent, we, we understand the information coming off, and we can use it to quickly uh, facilitate the broader mission needs of the A team. All right, great. And uh, Mark, I wanna go to you next uh, with a question. Uh, SPD3 said that you know, these functions should transfer to Department of Commerce. You mentioned before the NAPA study uh, that also analyzed this. Um, so you know, if you will, just help us understand why is this going to commerce? Why that particular agency? Why a change and why this agency in particular? Yeah, so, so there were a couple, a couple reasons right off the bat, you know, as initially stated, you know, one was to transition some of these functions um, you know, from DOD to focus more on the, the national security aspects of the mission. You know, as Gordon points out, you know, space traffic management is is across the board. There's there's uh, many folks that are that are uh, 
you know, still uh, key to, to making sure that actually takes place. Um, a couple of the issues that, that have been raised is one, you know, trying to find a civil agency to actually do the mission. Um, the focus on, on DOC was not only our commercial responsibilities of trying to promote the, the commercial space, um, US space industry, uh, but also trying to provide um, some innovative approaches with data management. We, we look at this predominantly as a data management problem on trying to make sure that we're able to you know, collect information, uh, provide it out and enable uh, you know, the, the industry to, to move off um, from, from that norm to, to other areas of focus. Um, it was also looked at too, is to not kind of trying to define a large bureaucratic structure, but still trying to foster a collaborative environment where we're a trusted conveyor, coordinator and provider of, of leadership uh, for not only domestic, but also internationally as well. So U.S. still has that, that leadership role across the international community. As Gordon and Lori have pointed out, you know, th this mission set has been done for a number of years. It has uh, established you know, the, the current state of play, but the environment is changing. There's more and more uh, satellites being launched. It's becoming more congested. Uh, there's large constellations that are going up. Um, but it's also an international problem too. Um, you know, we do not control space. There's a, a bunch of, of countries that, that, that share access to and operate in the, um, it's not like, uh, you know, airspace. Um, and it, as, I, as I stressed, you know, we're, you know we're, we're looked at from not only the capabilities within the department from the various bureaus, but also a primary, um, uh, expertise in the, in the Department of Commerce is the ability to manage these large diverse data sets and provide that on out. So not only the SSA and STM uh, abilities within the department and within NOAA, but also trying to deal with the large data sets separately. All right. Um, yeah, and so uh, next question, I've got a couple of questions here from the audience and Lori, I was hoping you could take a stab at this, uh, questions about active debris removal. Uh, and, you know, when's that going to make it into this conversation? Uh, so, you know, right now we talk about space situational awareness. It's really just, you know, we're just tracking what objects are up there, where they're going, uh, and you're trying to highlight potential collisions. Um, you know, when do you think uh, active debris removal is going to, you know, advance enough uh, that act that can actually start to play a role in removing some of these objects before we have conjunctions? So I know that's a, a, a big area of research right now. There's a lots of good ideas being tossed around and um, certainly the desire to avoid the Kessler syndrome and, and take some of these objects um, out of space before they can do harm. Um, NASA, though, does not have um, an active uh, area there and uh, using active twice, but uh, active debris renewal is not really part of the, the NASA portfolio, so I can't really comment on, on that. Um, we tend to break things up into two areas. One is um, or the Orbital Debris Program Office down at NASA Johnson looks at um, the orbit environment and how it's predicted out into the future. And then my group and the group down at JSC looks at on-orbit discrete um, objects and um, how to mitigate conjunctions with those. But unfortunately, I can't speak to uh, active debris removal as a topic. So. Gordon, uh, can you shed any light on that, or is there any uh, work going on out at SMC thinking about active debris removal? So, so in general, uh, my exposure to, to ADR activities has really been in the context of small business innovation uh, activities and contracts. We have a great relationship with DIU and AFWorks and have launched so many uh, new contract actions uh, related to everything from unique data exploitation capabilities to new uh, transport and comm to pass SDA data to, you know, looking now even at, at the potential for RFID uh, tags to put on, on satellites so that we can understand the exact position of an object in space before it gets there. Uh, today within operations, we uh, look at an all the all catalog, if you will, active and debris and potentials for collisions across all those uh, resident space objects. 
and that environment is getting more and more congested and more challenging. And so I, it, to me, it logically makes sense. This is just me personally talking, not, not a, a, an official uh, a line of the, the Space Force, but to me, it makes sense that we're going to look at that direction. I think one of the logical ways to get after those technologies would be through those cyber uh, initiatives that I just mentioned before. And I have seen some, some of those pop up. So um, I'd be interested. I, I do think it has alignment with this broader mission be that on the DOD or DOC side of the house, I think that could all play out in the future, but still the, the thought of, of, of not just trying to manage it a domain that gets ever more congested, but helping to thin out that domain to give us better understanding and insight may be a viable uh, approach to take from a national security defense, uh, defense space perspective. Okay. Um... Yeah, so my next question um, really is about uh, some of the nomenclature that's being used here. So we've thrown around several different uh, related terms here, space situational awareness, space domain awareness, space traffic management. Um, I want to get you know each, each of your panelists' perspectives on why do you use uh, certain terminology uh, when you talk about it from your organization? Uh, and, you know, how do you think about, uh, you know, how these different terms are used across the government? So, Mark, let me start with you. Um, what does Department of Commerce uh, call it? So, so we have the two terminologies, SSA and STM. Um, when we look back at, you know, the SPD3, that actually kind of defines some of these terminologies. Um, but you, you'll see that there's a wide var variation across, you know, different organizations that, that actually, you know, have different, different definitions. Um, I think Gordon kind of talked to the SDA, you know, they've, they've come out with a, a formal definition of what SDA is. And I think it's broader as, as Gordon kind of defined it, you know, beyond just, um, you know, SSA being kind of the knowledge characterization, characterization of space objects and their operational environment to support safe, stable, and sustainable space activities. We, we look at SSA as kind of a, identifying location and safety. Um, SDA and, and our, our uh, nomenclature actually kind of goes beyond to capabilities and intent, you know, kind of the military aspects of, you know, what is that object actually doing? So furthers the, the domain uh, knowledge associated with it. STM, you know, the definition out of SPD3 is the planning, coordination, and on-orbit synchronization of activities to enhance safety, stability, and sustainability for operations in the space environment. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things that are in there, but, you know, trying to make sure that we're, we're doing that coordination be, between the, the various folks, providing a common operating picture. You know, this is where getting to having owner-operator ephemeris shared broadly you know, could also help in, in, in get to the space traffic management. So it's not just kind of you know, bi-directional just between the, the two parties, but understanding where everybody is. So to have sustainable operations in the long term that you're operating in a in an orbital shell that, you know, other folks are not necessarily there or you understand what the conjunction possibilities would actually be. Gordon, uh, you know, does that kind of uh, correspond to, with the way the Space Force defines these different terms? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'll, I'll give a, a slightly different uh, lens, but it's gonna be consistent with what Mark said. Um, if I think about space situational awareness, that's the ability to search and discover objects in the sky, to characterize those objects, to have some kind of threat warning and assessment that um, a change is about to happen, you know, indication or warning that an event is happening. And then you have data integration and exploitation. Uh, the exploitation of data coming off of our sensors that inform information, inform knowledge for decision making. Those are the definitions of SSA. And SDA is, is, encompasses all of that, but it's really overlaid now with timeliness and a wartime load. SSA historically for me has been a peacetime operations of orchestrating management of, of activity within the space domain in a non-contested environment. SDA now needs to think about how do I handle a wartime load, a uh, contested environment, potential threats coming from multiple uh, directions, and how do I defend against that? And how do I give awareness to provide the opportunity to defend against that? 
uh, the orchestration between those two really become um, hand in glove with one another. Space traffic management is there for whether you're in a, a peacetime or a, a wartime scenario. And, and maybe that's even an artificial distinction because we're always, no matter what your, your context, you're gonna have to manage the background population of outer space. STM, space traffic management now is, is the norms by which we orchestrate activities within that space. And for me, as we think about going forward, whether you're doing it in support of a civil or commercial interest or national security defense interest, you're still gonna have to do space traffic management. And we're still gonna have to be aligned at our understanding of what's happening in the domain at large. The DOD may take classified or higher classifications uh, level data and add it to that basic understanding so that we have uh, a more exquisite and insightful understanding of what's happening in space. This allows us to make decisions. Uh, do you bank left or bank right? Is something hostile? Is it not? In a, in a timely manner to be tactically responsive. And this facilitates things like I talked about before with protect and defend operations. But ultimately, they're all interrelated and aligned with each other. And, and that's why I'm excited about this conversation with, with DOC, with DOD, with NASA. The, the transfer of civil and commercial STM functions to Department of Commerce is one that's smooth, is one that's, that's rolling forward in lockstep together. But it, that's just the key point. It is going to be together. And we're going to be concerned about the equities of SSA and SDA and space traffic management because success long term necessitates us to be on the same page in that regard. Lori, what are your thoughts? Terminology. <laughs> yeah, so I, I totally agree with uh, Gordon and Mark and the definitions they put forward for those terms. I will say that in the community, I hear a lot of people using the term space traffic management when what they really mean is conjunction assessment. So um, conjunction assessment is an enabling part of space situational awareness. It's just a piece of it. And then um, that in turn is part of SDA and um, all of those are part of uh, or contribute with space traffic management. But really space traffic manager is very, management is very broad. Um, and at least from a user perspective, um, I see lots of gaps there that are just waiting to be filled. Um, there's this lack of a central coordinating entity that would ensure that spacecraft aren't placed in the same orbit location. You know, we deconflict radio frequencies, but no one's deconflicting the actual physical placement of spacecraft. It's much easier to do for air traffic management because uh, I mean, all airplanes essentially have the same ways of moving around. Um, and so you can establish rules of the road because if you ask one plane to go up and one plane to go down or one plane to go left and one plane to go right, that's an easy thing for them to accomplish. Whereas space assets have a wide range of capability. Um, some don't have propulsion, some have low thrust propulsion, some have that can only, you know, takes a long time for them to maneuver somewhere. Um, chemical propulsion um, works very quickly, but you can have different size thrusters or varying amounts of fuel. So these variations make it really hard to establish um, standard rules of the road for space traffic in the same way. Um, and then we've got um, the advent of CubeSat and NanoSat technology that um, makes spaceflight available to a much wider range of operators than had been in the past. I mean, you've got your local elementary school putting up a CubeSat. So those people have different experiences and uh, levels of expertise. So they don't always know um, what is important for space safety and how to use it. So um, all these are challenges that I think have to be tackled as part of a space traffic management vision as we go forward. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, talking to uh, an old friend of mine uh, whose company had launched a small satellite and he said that they would get all these conjunction messages all the time and they just would shrug every time because their satellite had no propulsion system. It wasn't capable of maneuvering. So, you know, it was just kind of, well, watch out, we're coming through. <laughs> I hope we don't hit anything. Um, all right, I see we're almost out of time. I want to have one last question uh, go around here, thinking farther into the future and farther out from Earth. Um, you know, we, we could be entering an era over the next 10 years where we see more and more activity, civil space as well as commercial space activity uh, going on beyond just, uh, you know, geostationary Earth orbit all the way out to the moon and cislunar space. Um, so I just wanted to get each of your thoughts 
uh, about you know what are some of the initiatives that are underway right now, uh, or what are some of the gaps that we have uh, in technology for doing this SSA or SDA mission all the way out uh, in cislunar space. So, I, Gordon, I don't know if you if you uh, want to take this first. Uh, maybe talk about some of the Air Force Research Labs uh, initiatives that are ongoing. Sure, we'll do. Uh, well, first, I tie it back to our doctrine within Space Force. It clearly calls out that we have a responsibility not just to operate within the geocentric orbit regime, which is historically, you know, Leo through Geo, Heo, and where we've been focused, but also the cislunar orbit regime. Out, out through the moon and, and beyond the moon. If you think about um, Lagrange points and the different uh, gravitational orbits in the, in the moon environment, if you think about um, the solar radiation environment that exists in cislunar space, there are a lot of challenges that um, we will have to figure out how to operate with uh, and or figure out how to deal with to operate within that environment. But I will say, the need to figure that an or to answer that question and figure that out is real. Um, as we expand beyond the geocentric orbit regime, understanding movement in that broader space environment, we have, there's been a focus on sending capability back to the moon. Um, all that is going to beg of us to, to understand and, and the, the consequences and the the considerations that come along with operating in the cislunar environment. So today, uh, through a broader partnership that we have with Air Force Research Lab, as you highlighted, Todd, uh, we have actually released tech needs. We've initiated architectural analyses that are looking at existing sensors today and uh, working with operational units to plan, you know, what are your TTPs uh, or your tactics, techniques, and procedures for for operating in cislunar space and how is that different than geocentric space? What are our sensors seeing today and what do they need to see tomorrow? How do I take all that together and inform classes of solutions that can help us cover down in the cislunar environment writ large? In addition, we have prototypes efforts underway, one called um, Defense Deep Space Sentinel, which will be a cislunar orbit mobility uh, demonstrator that'll go up in the next year or two, uh, well, rather in 2022, 23 timeframe. That uh, is, is underway right now to put that prototype in orbit and that'll work its way out to the moon. And we're gonna learn about what it means to put an asset in that environment and how to operate it long-term in that environment. Ultimately, all these efforts together facilitate uh, investment decisions and recommendations uh, that ultimately uh, get after your broader architecture as it covers the challenges associated with um, the cislunar space. So it's definitely something real that we're concerned about, and it's definitely uh, a focus area for the future. Today, the focus is really to cover down uh, the LEO through GEO orbit regimes and be postured about how to move into the cislunar regime in the future. Lori, do you have any thoughts? Um, sure. So. Uh, today, NASA does have assets in um, cislunar space, um, and the process for protecting them is different than what we do for Earth orbiting missions. I mean, so for Earth orbiting missions, we rely on the DoD space catalog. They're tracking objects non cooperatively, they're producing this catalog, and then we um, compare the positions of our assets against the positions in the catalog and decide where there's close approaches. Since that catalog of objects doesn't exist for cislunar space, we don't have that as an option. So what we've put together is a process where we collect ephemerides from all the missions that are flying around a particular planetary body, and we screen those against each other and uh, make sure that there are not any close approaches and then cooperatively work to mitigate any close approaches. Um, but uh, if we were going to move to um, a method where we do it more similar to what we do for Earth orbit today, we would need a, a catalog of, of objects in cislunar space. And that's very challenging um, to try to track small objects in that region. So there's, there's that challenge. And there's also um, a data sharing challenge because if we're at the moon, but other countries also have missions at the moon, then we need to be able to share data with each other in order to at least do the uh, minimal um, flight safety process that we've put in place today. So. Um, those are the challenges there. 
we almost need a space fence on the moon. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mark, any final thoughts before we go? I see our time's almost up here. Um, with regard to the cislunar question? Sure, or, or any final thoughts overall? Yeah, you know, just like for the cislunar, you know, there's, there's commercial ventures that are coming along for ADR for even, you know, cislunar operations. You know, NASA's activities on, you know, offloading some capability of the commercial sector as well. You know, I think, I think eventually it'll, it'll grow, you know, we'll, we'll continue to be advocates as uh, the, for the economic growth of the U.S. space industry as those opportunities also come forward. And as Lori points out, you know, there's going to have to be some further development out there. Um, you know, we're, we're just not at, at that point as far as priorities on, you know, what we're going to do over the next several years. You know, eventually, you know, I, I think we, we do need to start worrying about those conditions. From a policy standpoint, I think there's some, some aspects across the government that have been, been dealt with. But as far as, you know, space traffic management, um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily on the, the front burner right now. All right. Well, our time is up. I want to thank our panelists uh, for joining us uh, for a really engaging uh, and and you know insightful discussion, going deep on this issue of uh, intergovernmental co uh, intragovernmental uh, cooperation when it comes to SSA and STM. Uh, so, Lori, Gordon, Mark, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope to have you back in the not too distant future here at CSIS. Thank you. <laughs>